guess the way this film began, I, I heard of uh, the Johnson City Air Film Film Find. Uh, it's not working. Uh, not working. Is that one working? Yeah. Uh, maybe some years after the, the discovery in uh, 1978, and um, it kind of reverberated around uh, uh, um, the film world for a few years, and then it kind of disappeared. And I always felt like it was such an incredible story that in some ways the discovery eclipsed the collection itself. And um, the really, I think Sam Kula wrote an essay, but there wasn't really any other academic or scholarly investigation of the collection. There's certainly never been a film about it. Um, and I always thought that it would be a good film to approach in this way, and that you would explore the collection and try to tell the incredible story of the gold rush and the um, discovery of the films in the swimming pool um, through the collection. Um, the opportunity came to do that uh, many decades later, I guess, um, when uh, I was invited up to Ottawa to show some films, and um, Paul Gordon, who organized the, um, the program or organized the screening, mentioned to me that he also um, was a conservator and really was in, in charge of digital scanning of the, um, the entire collection at the Library and Archives Canada in uh, Ottawa. And I said, well, don't you house the Dawson City collection? And he said, yes. And, um, so he invited me to play in his sandbox. And with somebody in place like that, um, it became much easier to access. And, uh, and he also knew the collection. And he knew other things that would support the collection. He lived in. Yellowknife and um, Paul really became instrumental in um, showing me what things could be found um, throughout the system um, that would support it. And very early on, I realized that I wouldn't have a movie without the photographs that Kathy had taken. And, um, and so I approached uh, Kathy and Michael for permission to, you know, to license the photographs. And um, I quickly found out that they were incredibly astute historians and um, that I, they would be invaluable collaborators. And um, so it was through my communication with them that we were able to build such a detailed um, history of the town and of the collection. And uh, Kathy and Michael, I wonder if you could talk a bit about uh, what were big surprises for you in when you were first going through some of these reels, because you already have an intimate knowledge of, of the history. So I'm sure certain things were surprising to us, but I'm just curious, you know, for, for you both, what, what stood out. Well, it wasn't really part of my job. I was a curator for Parks Canada. And when these things came up, it, it had nothing to do with our manual. But I had just started the job, and I was young, and uh, you know, I wanted to take on the world, and uh, this seemed like a really interesting thing. And uh, I might not have pursued it any further, but uh, about two days after, I had taken a reel of film and held it up in the lot where they were being uncovered. And I unspooled it a little bit, and I saw that the film was called The Strange Case of Mary Page. And then uh, two days later, I'm looking at the microfilm of the old Dawson News, and there was the advertisement for that very film in October of 1917. And I, the coincidence was just too compelling. And I started calling around. I called quite a few people before Klaus Hendricks suggested that I talk to Sam Kula. And uh, he saw the potential, and uh, it was kind of uh, a shot in the dark for him. He said, if there was a single frame of the film starring Theda Barra, he said it would be worth his time and effort. Well, they never found that, but they found <laughs> 327 Hollywood films that had otherwise been lost, and a lot of Canadian newsreels, which were of considerable importance to uh, the, our own country. And so they divided up the work between the Library of Congress and the National Film Archives, and then they, they shared the proceeds of their, their work mutually. And there, there it's been for the last 87 years. I don't know, Kathy? I, I think for myself, um, it was just another job that had been tubbed on me to handle. Go find some people that are um, maybe university trained that might uh, have a little more on the ball when it came to 
getting the stuff out of the ground. They had to take it out of town. Uh, we were provided with two hand reels and a bunch of plastic pores. And the idea was to brush off as much dirt as we could and, and rust and uh, then very carefully transfer them onto the uh, plastic cores. And periodically I would pop in and the students were sitting there and you know jumping up and down, oh look, 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 it's got a title or it's got a, one of the captions or it's got something. And uh, they were kind of having high fives every time they could find <laughs> a film title. And they, uh, uh, they'd come to me some days and say, well, we only found four film titles. The rest of it was just fiction. <laughs> and, and actually, of the films you've seen, there were well over 1,500 taken out of the ground. It's just that most of them were just blanks, or they were in pieces, or they just were disintegrating as they looked at them. And it's quite probable there are more in the ground because not uh, the whole tank didn't get dug up, just a certain portion of it. And we now know that, I think it's two years ago, a young woman was fishing along the banks of the Klondike, uh, sorry, the Yukon River in Dawson, and she actually fished up the reel of film. <laughs> what we don't know is, even though the uh, Yukon River is very cold, is her reel of film from the four tons that got dumped in the river, or did some, uh, uh, kids would come and take the reels out of the ground at night and then light them and pretend they were Kathleen wheels and wheel them down the street. So we don't know if that film, because we're still trying to find out who did it, whether that, uh, that means we need to find somebody with deep pockets and a sonar to go and check the river. Because in Dawson City, if you come up with an idea, usually it's in the ground somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, Bill and Alex, I wonder you might talk about how you combine everything uh, and orchestrate everything so beautifully and, and, and what your process of collaboration is. I'm kind of what, imagining that you almost are able to map it out because it, it, the way the music works with everything, it's like it's all part of the score. Yeah, it's really astounding the work that Alex did. I'm so appreciative and um, with his brother John, who did the sound design. And um, really, it was uh, earlier music that Alex had written um, that became sort of very instructive to me about the pacing and, and the whole mood of the piece. And so I used um, an earlier recording that uh, Yonzi and Alex had done called Bryce Boy Sleeps as a temp track. And the two of them had also created three um, tracks very early on, uh, several years ago, that um, really instructed me in, in some of the edit. Um, and then it was sort of like if, those, if that was the skeleton and I built the body of the film around it, eventually we had to take the skeleton out. And um, I guess I was finally able to deliver a rough cut or something as approximating a rough cut um, last spring to Alex and then he took it and um, really built from there. And I guess you can talk about what that process was like. Yeah, I think I got a rough cut in April or May and then I, I just started spotting it. Um, I'd already been writing and recording for a while. I, I went to Bill's apartment like three years ago and he got really inspired and he showed me lots of the raw footage and, and told me that he was working with Rice Boy Sleeps and wanted to do something really dreamy. And, and yeah, it was really inspiring and I kind of just used the like distorted broken film as the, the guide you know I wanted to make music that sounded like it's kind of falling apart or something <clears throat> I mean it also kind of sounds like history is being born and reborn and reborn so the rising and fall of the music too we create you know we created different chapters and then um, Alex matched those with different beds of music and then we exchanged edits all summer long and uh, into a, we reached sort of a fever pitch at the end there where he actually went yeah. back in the studio and uh, only days before we premiered the film at Venice and uh, did, I don't know, three or four days with strings, which yeah. was just incredible. Yeah, Bill decided he really liked the strings and we had very little. So we were like, oh my God, we have to do strings for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so then we just did that and we just didn't sleep. Yeah. Neither of us were sleeping, yeah. so we could call each other anytime, it was no problem. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. My brother was working for Baltimore in the sound design with me and Reg here. So between the time difference, I think, 
there was no downtime for like 10 days or something. It's been great. Yeah. Well, history never sleeps. <laughs> Cinema never sleeps. Well, we're also never sleep. Um, I'm sure people have a ton of questions, so I'll turn it over to Q&A. Um, yes, way over here. Um, yeah, it's an astounding piece of work. Um, I wanted to ask whether somebody has undertaken the gargantuan task of identifying the actors and actresses. And I wanted to specifically ask, I thought years ago, King Vidor or somebody had conclusively proved that Mary Miles Minter's mother killed William Desmond Taylor. <laughs> you know you're going to get asked something like that. Like uh, conclusions about that movie. And, uh, I think a dozen deathbed confessions or something. So, uh, everybody seems to want to claim that they killed that guy. <laughs> um, but yes, to answer your earlier question, there is a massive Word doc that has all the information about who directed it, the studio, what year, who started it. It's exhaustive. Um, 